Um, so thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, it is true, I've been in the industry a long time and graduated in 1981 from the Otago School of Mines in Mineral Processing. But I didn't really do much mineral processing throughout my career except to the extent that I was always involved in it from a um, technology commercialization point of view. Um, so I'll just explain a little bit of that. Um, I've got a, this is my uh, advertising slide, so uh, I'll get it out of the way quickly. Um, so you can see here, process engineering, I work for a company called uh, Mineral Deposits Limited, which is now known as Mineral Technologies, part of the Gala Group. Um, I then uh, moved over into technology sales and commercialization through um, mainly two companies, um, what was known as Envirotech, uh, now part of Ethel Schmidt, um, and also MIM Process Technologies, which is now, uh, that group has now, of course, become Glencore Technology. Uh, I then joined Hatch, and uh, a good deal of my Hatch career was uh, to do with uh, sustainability and the application of um, design practices to sustainability. And in that role, um, I became quite heavily involved with the Sustainable Minerals Institute, of which I'm an industry fellow and have been for about seven years, seven or eight years. Um, and uh, I endeavoured to spend one day a week over at the St. Lucia campus, um, James Cook's building. Um, and as, as part of all of that, I became the Hatch uh, uh, gatekeeper, if you like, to their um, contributions and receipts of uh, research. So I have had uh, quite a lot to do with, um, I guess, research proposals and so on from the industry perspective. I uh, just wanted to make mention of a few of my current clients who have uh, put up with me coming here this morning uh, instead of attending to their business. Uh, I know last week you listened to um, Nick Redwood from Wiggle Consulting. I also have a, um, a role with them. Um, and if you've got any questions that uh, left over from last week, I could probably yeah, at least listen to them and attempt to uh, talk about that. Uh, core resources was mentioned. Um, I've recently renegotiated that arrangement so that I'll be working for them 50% of my time uh, from the end of this month onwards. Um, and specifically to do with the album process and its uh, next stage of commercialization. Uh, and uh, my former employer, uh, uh, Hatch, I've been working uh, with them just recently in, in, a, uh, in a closure project for the Ranger in the uranium mine. Just recently, there's the SMI and, uh, and some facilitation for the seat. So that's hopefully the only advertising that we uh, have to deal with today. Um, so uh, uh, it was suggested that I include some highlights, uh, particularly around commercialization. So um, I'll do that. And, but I've connected them to some of the concepts that I want to talk about. In the end, um, I think uh, it'll be quite a short presentation because I wanted to leave a lot of time for discussion and, and questions. Um, so in reverse order, I, I am quite proud of the, the work that we did uh, developing SUSOP, uh, uh, firstly within Hatch and then later on in the CSRP and the SMI. And, uh, that, uh, I'll, I'll connect that to the technology uh, adoption curve later on. That was over quite a lengthy period, 2007 to 2012, and I'm still a great fan of this. Um, earlier, um, and if I was to pick uh, the number one from these shortlist of three, I would pick this one as my number one um, best involvement, if you like. Uh, but the, the commercial launch of the ISO to the market, I think, was a uh, was <laughs> A seminal part of, uh, of, of that technology uh, where we took it from a, uh, an internally developed uh, technology and, and took it to market. And the Eisenmill now has uh, got over 100 installations around the world and uh, uh, been developed uh, since I left. That was in uh, the late 90s. Um, and then uh, I uh, actually held a world record for about 10 weeks. World record in terms of the largest volume flotation cells ever sold at 92 cubic meters. It was a world record at that point, um, not for very long. Uh, but it was also the largest in dollar value as well at the time. So um, you can talk to a salesman, they do tend to speak in dollar values. Um, as I say, 10 weeks, and then a colleague of mine somewhere else in the world had done 
sold for three quarters of cents. You can have it anymore. But I'm, I'm actually pretty proud of that one for a number of reasons, and I'm going to connect it to the concepts I'm talking about uh, uh, as the trust, trusted assistant buyer. Um, so, quite early on in my commercial, the commercialization part of my career, um, I was a bit concerned that a metallurgist becoming a salesman, and we don't use that term very often in, in our industry, it's, it's a little bit of a pejorative, and I was a little bit troubled by my change, if you like. And uh, a great mentor of mine by the name of Granville Heer, I don't know if anybody knows Granville, but Tim probably does. Um, he said to me one day, you don't have to worry about that, Philip. <coughs> don't have to worry about that. Okay, tell me more. So he said, what happens when you get an order on the fax? Which is the, we didn't have computers in those days, but fax. I said, well, we ring the bell. We had a bell on the wall when we used to hit it. Bring it so that everybody in the building knew that we just got an order. And a small order's got a, got a tap, a slightly larger order's got two, and uh, really good ones. We kept going. And he said, oh, yeah, of course, and you have to shake hands and, you know, and go for a drink maybe, but what happens after that? I said, well, I, I ring the boss. <laughs> so, uh, and after that, well, I write it up. He said, aha, you write it up. And then what? Well, I give it to Fred. And Sydney. Okay? And what does Fred do? Well, organises to build the equipment and send it to the client. I said, he said, yeah, exactly. And what happens if you didn't write the order? Well, Fred doesn't do anything. And so if nobody wrote an order, well, Fred did. He loses his job. So I said, so he said, well, that's why it's important. You're creating work within our company, you're creating work in our subcontractors, and you're providing a service or a product to a client who's then going to make money out of that piece of equipment. So you shouldn't worry about being a metallurgist turning yourself into a salesman. And he used the term salesman. So I was greatly buoyed by that, certainly for at least a week. And uh, I carried on. So when did it happen and why did it happen? Well, um, is anybody here from China? One, two, anybody here been to China? Okay, well, I blame China. So, <laughs> so three years ago, this is me, it was a very hot day in Beijing and, uh, and uh, they were uh, doing some repairs to the, uh, the, the entrance to the Forbidden City without covering up Mount Wong's uh, portrait, of course. And what I was attempting to do here was to get close enough to a spot where I'd been 30 years previously in 1985. <clears throat> I'm the one in the middle, by the way. Now, I'm sorry about the dress fashions from the 1980s, and, and I'm sure the Chinese uh, dress fashions have changed a bit too. But, um, so that, that was a before and after. So why was I in China? Well, on that particular trip, I had been uh, given a, um, a, a task by Mineral Technologies to uh, try and convince some, uh, an organization in Tangshan uh, to adopt a cold spiral technology. That wasn't particularly successful, but I sort of became a China person all of a sudden. And uh, about six months later, I was in uh, Guangzhou, a lot further south, a lot better weather. And uh, so this is, I'm the one in the centre again, by the way. And uh, I'm sorry about the 1980s style football shorts that we were wearing in the test room. Now, that's a Reichardt cone you can see there, and there's some spirals on the left-hand side. Now. Uh, I, uh, I didn't start with the safety share, which is relatively normal, in, in, but I, I changed my mind about doing safety shares first because it shouldn't be the first thing you do, it should be the most important thing you do. And in the 1980s, we actually hadn't invented hard hats at this point, so we couldn't wear them. Now, this is not this is not because I was in China and not wearing a hard hat, it's because actually at the technologies in 1985 or 1986, we just didn't wear hard hats. And I just, Put it to you, the change in 30 years that we've come with all the PPE that we would wear. In the mid 80s, big companies were starting to make compulsory, but, uh, but not yet us. It was only a couple more years. This lady here was extremely uh, funny, and uh, we had no common words, the Mandarin and English, and neither of us could speak each other's language, but we had great fun competing on trying to guess the pulp density of that feed material on the top of that, like our 
we spent all day at it. It was great. So I enjoyed that. Um, they asked me to speak, a little bit like today, and uh, 30 years and probably 30 kilos, I don't know, I'm sure. <coughs> anyway, so here's me uh, uh, talking about uh, profiles on spirals and uh, other things. And uh, I sort of liked that. Not only that, I sort of liked entertaining and having banquets. And it just occurred to me that supporting technical sales might be something that I would do. So um, very shortly after this, I did change companies. I was working for Biotech, had 11 years with them. Moved on to MIM. And uh, so this is me fully fledged as a salesman, uh, manning a booth. So that's something you can do. This is in Santiago. And uh, I was with a colleague of mine, Andrew Murphy. I'm not sure if you know Andrew, but uh, uh, he and I have had uh, worked with the same companies quite often. He took that photograph. Uh, the next day, we were hard at work in the ski fields. It was uh, only half an hour's drive from the hotel, which was great. And after this, we went on to uh, Alumbrera, which was at the time an MIM, I guess it's still Pen part of Penkel's uh, um, uh, group uh, in Argentina. And uh, we, were, we had a rather large Jameson cell uh, installation there, the largest uh, in the metalliferous area at the time. And we were doing some troubleshooting, or actually Murph was doing the troubleshooting, I was just supervising. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, on the way back, we uh, we came through Tukumani Airport, and uh, the problem was that there was an airplane there with its cowling off and a toolbox on it. So we're never going to get to Buenos Aires on, on this airplane. We've got to be in Lima the next day. What are we going to do? Sure enough, there was delay. They had to send another airplane, so we had six hours to wait. Uh, in Tukuman Airport. So what do you do when you've got a spare six hours to do Tukuman Airport? Well, you meet some locals. <laughs> <laughs> These three ladies were extremely interesting, I've got to say. They were from the protocol department of President Ben, and they were stuck in Tukuman Airport. So we were working for the President of an airplane. We didn't have much time. Now, you'll notice that the drinks in front of me are actually soft drinks, and it's nothing to do with the alcohol. So this is why I enjoyed doing sales, as opposed to getting my hands dirty in, in the metallurgy. It wasn't always like that, of course, because I did a lot of commissioning of the products that I sold. Okay, so that's enough of that. Look, we're up to slide five here of 14, so we're almost halfway through, and I haven't spoken to you about the concepts yet. All right, now, so we'll start there. So this is a, this is a disclaimer. Uh, and you might find this disclaimer in any contract, so I'll read it to you. In this presentation, except to the extent the context otherwise requires, the singular includes the plural and vice versa. Words denoting any gender includes all genders. <laughs> and words denoting individuals include corporations and vice versa. And I need to say that because the first concept I want to introduce to you is the man. Now, the man is not some misogynistic uh, attempt to uh, impress you, but uh, this is a, an acronym that stands for the personal persons in the organization with the money, the authority, and the need. We all know for sure <laughs> that we don't interrupt the speaker. <laughs> right, money to the authority and the need. Um, I've heard quite often people say, you've got to get to the economic buyer. And it's not enough. The economic buyer is not enough. It's got to be the man. The man can be more than one person. In fact, almost always is in our industry. It's, it can be one person, two people, a group of people, a technical committee. And it can also be a procurement department. Mm -hmm. If you're selling pump spare parts, it's almost always a procurement department. Uh, <coughs> procurement department. They're quite different people to get along with. And if you're in a technical role, uh, they, they can actually be uh, quite uh, difficult to, to work around. Nevertheless, there's, uh, very, there's very good reasons to, uh, to be um, uh, confident with them and comfortable with them. Now, I want to tell uh, another anecdote right away. And uh, the main person in this anecdote, I told, told him I was going to do this, so don't no worry, it's all okay. It's about the first time I, I met a fellow called Peter Munro. Now, I know that 
quite a number of people in this room will know Peter. So I was a brand new flotation cell salesman selling Wenco flotation cells at a time when the majority of flotation cells in Australia, this is about 1987, uh, were Agitair machines. And about 20% of them were at Mount Isa. It was uh, dominated the industry. They were small, about 2.8 cubic meters, and uh, there were hundreds of them around. And Mount Isa had several hundred at that time. So uh, the idea in our company was, well, we need to go to Mount Isa and get them to replace all of these with our wonderful self-aspirating big cells. That was the job. Uh, which, in my naivety, um, I thought, well, this, this will be okay. We've got all these features about it. This will be great. So I went up and we had a, two appointments. So we flew up the night before, and we had two appointments. One with Paul Perrin at 9 o'clock, and one with Peter Munro at 10 o'clock. Easy. So I went with a fellow called Matt Churchill, who came from San Romero to help me with the introduction of web quotation cells. So we bowled up to the first meeting with Paul Perrin. He was with the play, we were chatting. Uh, Matt and Paul knew each other. And, uh, Occasionally the words like flotation and recovery came into the conversation, but it was more or less more about pathways and today's slice and all that sort of stuff. Making the best cuts. And I was looking at my watch and I and I'm I'm married to a lady who thinks that if you turn up on time, you're already ten minutes late. So I was well in the we were ten years at this point, and we were well I was really nervous about this getting to see Peter Munro on time and they were chatting away and carrying on and thought it's a bill. Peter works for me, just tell him I held you up. He said, okay, how long does it take to get there? 20 minutes, uh, Bruce security, whatever. Anyway, we turn up at Peter's office and we were 12 minutes late. Now, Peter in those days was quite blunt. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think what had happened is that he, he, he had his office refurbished and he made this little platform to put his desk on. So it was about 12 inches higher than the rest of us. And then he had these two special chairs for beggars, which he chopped three inches in the <laughs> So we sat down there and he was there, and we were 12 minutes late and this. And I think we got a handshake in, but after that it was, I'm going to give you some advice, Bill. Never be late. I've got an important meeting at 10.30, and now we're not going to have enough time to talk. So I was thinking, okay, I thought, you know, people have warned me a little bit, but it was a bit in your face. He said, uh, uh, what do you want to talk to me about? And I said, oh, I have this pitch ready, this, all these slides. They weren't PowerPoint slides, of course, in 1987, but they were in a folder, and I was ready to um, explain the benefits of the Wemco flotation cells. I said, oh, I'd like to talk to you about Wemco flotation cells. And he said, no, 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 no. Nothing, no, 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 I'm not interested. We've got Agitair flotation cells here. I want some more. That's all I'm interested in. I said, but, it's not but me. We have got <laughs> decades of experience with agitated implantation cells, and we got D Dr. Bill Johnson. I don't know if it was from a, you know, from a fish. So I said, okay, I was writing down Bill's name. I said, is that with an H or no? If you don't know who Dr. Bill Johnson is, you need to find out. I need some agitated implantation cells. Are you the right people? I said, well, yes, of course, you know, we, we sell the HDF and so as well. Right, I'll send you a fax this afternoon. And he stopped off. Well, he went down the corridor, scattering, you know, graduate metallurgists left and right. <laughs> <laughs> and he's gone. Basically, he said, see yourself out. So I was the guts, you know, this is not a good introduction to Matt Isa. And, uh, but Matt, he was laughing, carrying on. And we weren't late for our flight, we got to the airport well on time. He had about seven minutes with Peter, and uh, he was just chuckling and carrying on. I said, what's so funny? I'm, I'm devastated. And he said, that's the easiest order you're ever going to get. That guy was the man. A bit crazy, but he's the man. <laughs> that's all he wants. You've got to make sure you slap on a bit of extra margin. So, <laughs> was, was Peter the man? He was trying to buy some agitated flotation cells. He did not want to hear about my Wemco flotation cells at that time. We talked about don't like self-aspirating, don't like big cells, we know how to make this song, we've got Dr. Bill Johnson. He said doctor many times. <laughs> and um, we know what we're doing, he can't tell me anything. And so that doesn't matter, right? So the guy's going to buy something, there's going to be a contract, there's going to be something, some exchange. 
So the money, the authority, the need. In that case, it was a single person because he had the authority and the imprimatur of Dr. Bill Johnson to, to say, yeah, that's what we need, that's what we're going to buy. Paul Kerrigan would have signed off on that in an instant. So three guiding principles, I think. Um, no one likes to be sold to. So here are, as a salesman, you learn quickly that nobody likes to have a pitch that's uninteresting or irrelevant. And, and if you're over the top, they don't like it. Nobody likes to be sold to, but everybody likes to buy stuff. I've got to tell you that. So if you can put it in terms of how they should buy it, that makes a big difference. So to get there, you must therefore become the assistant buyer. And I actually physically walk around the desk and sit next to them when I'm trying to convince them about my idea, my product, my service, whatever it happens to be. I think that's a lesson for research selling, is you need to be the assistant buyer. You almost have to represent their company in your own company and do the best for them. It's about the exchange of trust, and both doing that is a very good first step. Come the assistant buyer. I can't overemphasize that enough. You've got to find value, and I'm, I've got to, the next slide is about how I calculate value, or at least envisage value. It's not. You're asking a. You're asking somebody to exchange a whole pile of money for for some value that they're going to get. And if the balance is like this, this is the value that they can see, and this is the money they've got to pay for. There's no sale. You've got to make them do this in their mind. So you have to find value. And there's always hidden needs. So if you've ever received an inquiry to present, uh, to, to, to provide a service or a, or a product or a research proposal, what's stated in that inquiry, that written inquiry, is not the whole story. And I'll come to that on the slide after next. Uh, everybody knows about Australian Standard 4183, I'm assuming. Uh, anybody? This is the standard that uh, uh, engineering consultancies use when they're asked to find value in a project. It's, an, it's a relatively interesting document, actually. It talks about value. But it says value in, as a function of three things. UBI. I don't know, Glenn, I've spoken to you about, about UBI. So what is U? Well, it's the usefulness or the utility of something. There's no point in buying anything unless it's useful for you. So it's quite a use. And we sometimes forget that it's got to have a use. Salesmen always get really hot and sweaty about the benefits. And you'll get features and benefits all day long from somebody who knows what they're talking about. But it's not the whole story. So benefit, yep, you've got to have high benefit. And we always forget about I, which is importance. So I was speaking to uh, Chris Greet uh, not so long ago uh, from Magato. And he had this wonderful proposition for a client, for a potential client, a $4 million saving a year, something I can't remember. The guy was interested in $400 million a year savings, not $4 million. It was not important. But the, the product vendor, the, the service provider, thinks it's important. But you've got to establish, is it important for the person you're trying to convince? We always forget about the importance. And there's nothing more boring than a salesman who thinks they're important your context, pitching something at you you don't want to listen to. There's nothing more boring. So, value is a function of utility, benefit, and importance. You've got high, high marks in all three of those, you've got your values there. Hidden needs. So, stated needs are not the, not the whole story. And I think it's worth 50%. In other words, 50% of your chances of winning some work was persuading somebody to your to your argument. It's worth 50% of your effort for sure to establish what the hidden needs are. So what might the man have as a hidden need? Well, sometimes it's just a thought bubble and it's not a serious inquiry and you really have to weed those things out because they can and do take up valuable time from, uh, from more productive work. Very often they have a problem to solve and if you can solve it, then you're well on your way to finding it. But corporate principle, corporate procedures and, uh, and uh, philosophy, and particularly procurement departments, never want you to state that you've got a problem. 
because it diminishes your advantage. With a vendor, they detect that you are um, in, in a great need and the, the bargaining power is less. So uh, I need that as a hidden need. They are in trouble, they need a problem solver. Particularly if it's important enough that it's a burning platform, then that is really important to know. If you're the solution to something that no one else, then you can be robust about your negotiation, be robust about your your margins. All you want is a whole bunch of HD flotation cells. And the only person that can provide it to you is that vendor there. Then that's where you've got to go. So it's good to know if there's a burning platform. And I suspect in the research arena, burning platforms are actually very important. I would think operating companies would, would, would consider fundamental research specifically, but any sort of research as, um, wow, we've got to go that far to solve our problem, that's a burning platform. <clears throat> they may, the person or persons who are the man, uh, may have a KPI that they may, need to meet. I, I very often solve things into people who are really desperate to meet a KPI this month. And they, they're in a hurry, they don't have time to make a, a decision between various different vendors. If you can find that out, that's also interesting. And uh, I'm sure that that's applicable in research. The person, particularly if it's a one person, they may have a career to embellish. That's very important as well. If you can help them do that, that you'll have a friend for life. In my rose, my friend for life. I'm sure I embellished his career by uh, not um, insisting on talking about Weco flotation cells. Um, or they may have a bad week to get over. If you can help them, if you're there on a Friday afternoon and you can help, you save them a couple of million dollars uh, in the future. And they've had a bad week. I mean, you make them feel good. They'll pull cool you back. It's always very good. So hidden needs. These are not stated in documents. They're not admitted to lightly. It takes investigation. So um, I know almost all of you will have seen this before. Uh, I suspect I lifted this from a presentation by Joe Peace uh, from last year. But I'm not quite sure. But anyway, just in case it was Joe's, I, I took it from somewhere. Uh, so this is the adoption curve of technologies and uh, of course I've, I've done technolo technology commercialization. The, the, the ISML is a, is a good case in point. Uh, where on this curve were we? It's an interesting, an interesting question which I'll answer in a moment. So uh, I will circle the early adopters. In innovators tend to be people who will just buy new stuff because it's just yeah, they don't, they don't make too much of an effort to figure out whether it's actually going to do them any good, they just, it's new. Uh, we don't have many of those in our industry, I must say. Uh, but we do have some early adopters, and these are people who would, uh, according to this, is somewhat keen to try out new technology. They appreciate a product's potential to give their organization a competitive advantage. And when we say product, it could be a service or a research, um, a, a line of research. They tend to have more influence than the innovators because these are generally regarded as a little bit left field. Um, but the early adopters are, are the most important people for, I think, for research and for uh, new technologies. Uh, the, but the biggest amount of business flow or income is generated not by those people but by the pragmatists or the early majority. So these are, they represent the bulk of the market. They tend to buy into new technologies only when there's a proof statement. So in the ISML, we have a proof statement, an internal to MIM. Uh, at Mount Isa and at MacArthur River, there were ISML installations already approved by the company that was trying to sell them. That made a huge difference to the ability to be able to launch into non-MIM companies. The first of which was KCTM in, uh, in Western Australia. They are pragmatists, that these are the people that will automatically say no thanks until you've proven that, that, that there's something there. And earlier somebody mentioned about the Albion process. Uh, that is probably about, uh, about the time that it's going to move. 
from uh, early adopters into early majority. At least we think so. So uh, Wemco flotation cells, um, they, at the time that I was involved with them, they were actually the most sold flotation cell in the world, just not in Australia. That Australia was, uh, was not, not adopting Wemco very much, although by the time I finished with it, we had uh, got to about 40% of the market. Uh, we were in that arms race, you know, getting bigger and bigger flotation cells. We were, we were you know, our big flotation cells at that time were um, the book. 38 versus the, the Wemco uh, um, 500 cubic foot um, and 1,000 cubic foot cells, um, which is 14.2 and 28.3 cubic meters, and then the 1,500 cubic foot cell, which is 42.5. So they were incredible. You couldn't line them up if you were an engineering company. You couldn't get a really easy thing because of the metric versus the, uh, the US units. <coughs> So uh, early and late majority for Wemco, uh, Jameson Cell, and sorry, Jameson Cell, uh, when I arrived into the MI organization, there was a very good footprint in coal, uh, not too much in metalliferous, and we were, we, we, it was hard work in metalliferous. Mount Isa had, uh, had shown the way a little, a little bit, both at Mount Isa and uh, in Alguera, but uh, it hadn't made its mark yet. So it was uh, somewhere between early adopters for metalliferous, but uh, early majority for coal at that time. The Eisenhower obviously was an early adopter. And Sussel, um, I, I don't know, Glenn, I suspect it's still in the, uh, still in the innovators area. Yes, if innovators mean it's not making much money, then it's <laughs> Correct, correct. It doesn't make much money at the moment. So uh, I'm sure you've seen this, and, uh, and, and I think it's a good mental model to have. Now this you won't have seen because this is my personal mental model of how to make a sale. And it's very personal, but I thought I'd share it with you because you need something. And not this because it's very complicated and uh, built up over about 20 years. Uh, but I'll take you through some of the things in here that I use to help me when I'm trying to either sell something or to at least promote a new idea. And I would, I would, I would use this, I think, uh, in research as well. So the first thing is establishing the man, which we've spoken about quite a lot. You'll notice that I've got a, uh, a timeline across here which, which talks about various uh, phases in the way to, uh, to winning work. Um, and I've, uh, I've got these stars of these the, the important parts here. So the request for quotation arrives is a very important part of it and there's a replacement over here. Um, so uh, you've got targeting and intelligence gathering and test work and selling and then this point here is very important. So I always feel that you need to at least get to four or five times to impress people in that sales process. And people don't buy big bits of mineral processing equipment, nor put millions of dollars down into a research pro project unless they're thinking about it over an extended period of time. And if you have competitors, they are doing the same thing. So you've got to be able to get to the person you need, to the man, the people you need, uh, multiple times. It's no good. One visit, one proposal, and the second one's going to be convinced. It just doesn't work that way. So that's why it takes a lot of time. And these weeks here uh, can vary because if you're selling up step ups, it's different to flotation cells, it's different to engineering services. $8 million worth of engineering services is a, is a different thing to $40,000 worth of pump, pump parts. So these things take a um, different, different amount of time. And in research, you would have to figure out what those what those are. I think these things are all the, all the same. Uh, okay. Uh, in terms of uh, if you like uh, product sales or service uh, services, this point is extremely important. Basically, when the RFQ arrives on your desk, the client has already made up their mind who they're going to buy. No matter that they've got three or four people asking for prices asking for information. They've already decided. It's a shock to most people to hear that, but they know what they're going to buy. They're just going through a process that confirms that that's the right decision. It's open. Honestly. So in, in engineering services, there's a rule. 85% of the time, the incumbent wins the next stage. It's 85%. If you're not the incumbent, then there's 15% left. You may be the preferred, if you're not the incumbent, you have to be one or the other. 
that's another 10% of the time. It's a non-incumbent preferred will win 10%. And then everybody else gets 5% of the time. And it really has to be really weird for anyone else to win that work. It's a little bit different with uh, mature technologies where you've got, um, uh, if you were to take conventional flotation cells as an example, there are, there are, there are options. Probably two liters and a third, one trying, and all the fifth one members of the technology. There's options. But in most cases, they've already made up their mind. Um, so you have to become either the preferred or the incumbent by the time you get to this point. Otherwise, it's not any point bidding. Sometimes it costs a lot of money to make a proposal. So uh, to the left is the lowest selling cost and the, the highest ability of influence. To the right is the highest selling cost and the lowest ability of influence. If, you're in a, if you've got a procurement department running this thing, you aren't allowed to talk to the technical people after the RFQ is sent out. So you've got no options there. Okay, quickly through the rest of them. Um, criteria about whether to bid or not is very important in, in, in the sales. And I would suggest in research, you need to have criteria about what you would, would do. It's all wrapped up in this diagram. This is the actions that to, to create those opportunities, you need to do all of these sorts of things. Establish differentiators, establish trust, figure out what the scope is, what the hidden needs are. I've got a word in here, marginalized procurement. That only occurs if you need to um, get very technical. Uh, procurement can get in, in the way sometimes. Uh, at other times, they're, they are actually the most important. <coughs> OK. Final slide. Has anybody seen the Carnarvon before? It's a Welsh word, so it's not going to be pronounced in English the way you would expect. I'm not even sure I got it right, so how do I answer that? Um, so this is a way of understanding uh, systems, uh, and it can be used to look at uh, management techniques or, or management styles. It can be used for all sorts of different things, and I like to use it as a way to figure out what the man, the people who are the man, uh, what type of they are. Because if they're different types, then there's different approaches. So. Um, I'll start with symbol. In Carnarvon uh, way of thinking, project management is an example of a simple system. We've got to put a billion dollars worth of process plant together in nine months. That's a simple task because it's highly proceduralized, it's best practice. You know what to do, you just gotta do it. And you just gotta deal with the upsets that happen along the way. So project managers will possibly be a gas and it's only a simple thing because of course it's, it's not. There's a lot of things to do. They're generally simple because they've got procedures. It's well known how to do it. Consulting and engineering is in the realm of complicated. So um, instead of sensing, categorizing and responding using best practice, you're now sensing, analyzing and responding. So this is a bit more engineering and more research perhaps but it's about analysis now. And it's not obvious what the answer is at the beginning, but you can work it out. So it's complicated. It's good practice. I think research sits in the complex area, particularly uh, fundamental research. You actually don't know that there is an answer, necessarily. You hope there is, so you throw it and you have a look. You sense what it is and then you respond. So if you're a researcher and you're wanting to put to a um, potential sponsor, for instance, a, uh, a new way of thinking about something, I don't know what, and you're, and you're here in, uh, in, the, in the emergent, you know, process response complex area, if you're talking to somebody who deals in project management, they are not going to be very easy to convince, I can guarantee they will wonder why you're taking so long to do things. They don't understand why you go down blind alleys all the time. Surely you don't go down blind alleys. I've got a system over here, would you like to use it? <laughs> and they don't understand. It's very, very difficult. And I've been in situations like that, and the opposite, by the way, where I, you know, research is relatively hopeless in approaching them by comparison to these guys. So, that's why I would say uh, understand who you should be talking to, not who the, the 
potential sponsor asks you to talk to, they may be the wrong person and it'd be very difficult to, to, uh, to convince them. Chaotic is, well, um, crisis management. There is no, you don't even know that, you don't even know anything. Right? So the only thing you can do is just do something. Anything. Use experience and what have you, but just do something, see what happens. That, um, that happened just recently, uh, where I was called in this, into a crisis, <laughs> a crisis management chaotic situation. We just tried a couple of things and it all come out in a couple of weeks. So it, it, it definitely happens. And one of the things that does happen is that you can be going along in a, in a simple system and it's all behaving nicely and then something really odd happens and you fall off a cliff into the chaotic situation. And then people who are used to best practice simple following procedures are actually not necessarily the right people to fix that. And that's why you have people coming to manage crises. It's not a reflection on the people who have, people say they screwed up, but actually it's, it's something much more has happened and that they're not the best people to rescue it. Okay, so just going around in a, uh, around the same uh, thing in terms of a sales um, model on the same things. If you're if you're thinking about um, some of the things I've been in, uh, involved with, then uh, a competitive a competitive and mature technology is definitely in the uh, in the simple. People know your equipment. If you're just judging between two different types of innovation cells, you've got very similar. Um, performance criteria, then it's a relatively simple thing. There's, there's criteria to use. <coughs> um, new technology is probably complicated. No, I don't think it's complex. I think it's complicated. <coughs> so even it can be tested. If you sort of know what to do, you can respond as you test it. Um, but piloting new technology is probably in the complex. You're not necessarily sure that it's going to be. You haven't got that far. You've never really done it in the industry. Probably the confidence. And then burning platforms are uh, crisis management. So, uh, last slide is to, um, is to bring all of that together and uh, open for discussion. So, I would say uh, the key points would be uh, remember to be the assistant buyer and find the man and their hidden needs. Express value in terms of uh, utility benefit and importance. Uh, recognize the man's tolerance for risk and the position in the adoption curve. And uh, have a, a model or a plan, some, some way to judge how you will uh, take yourself from the idea through to getting a sponsor, getting a sale, getting an idea across. That's where I will leave it uh, in terms of presentation, but of course, uh, are you going to moderate some questions?